Have you come across the term triangulation while working on your research paper? And you might have a rough idea of what it means, but you're not entirely sure? Then sit back and relax. In this video, I will explain briefly but precisely what triangulation in research is all about. Additionally, I'll provide you with all four types of triangulation and how you can implement these techniques. This way, you can elevate your research design to the next level and make your research methodologically robust. And now, without further ado, welcome to Schreib. You can easily derive the meaning of triangulation from Latin. Tri means three and angulus means angle. So triangulation involves measuring in a triangle, a concept that originates from land surveying. However, outside of land measurement and geometry, empirical social research has adopted this term. And that's what we're focusing on now. When we talk about triangulation, we are on a methodological level. It's about how a research design can provide as much insight as possible about a phenomenon using multiple perspectives. While it is commonly associated with qualitative research, it can also be applied in quantitative and mixed methods research. To avoid confusion, let's look at the definition of triangulation in the context of research from our colleague Flick. Triangulation involves taking different perspectives on a subject under investigation or more generally when answering research questions. These perspectives can be realized in different methods applied and or different chosen theoretical approaches, both of which are related to each other. The goal of triangulation is to gain deeper insights than would be possible with just a single method or a single theoretical perspective. Using the metaphor of land surveying again, the position of an object can be determined more accurately when viewed from multiple different angles. To help you apply triangulation in your research, here are the four most prominent types. Type 1. Method triangulation. This is the, probably the most common one. Densin, the father of triangulation, so to speak, even distinguishes between within method and between method triangulation. Within method triangulation could involve using two different interview guides to loosen the constraints of methodological decisions when creating a qualitative research design. Between method triangulation would involve adding a second method in our example, you could distribute an additional online questionnaire to the employees of a company that you have previously interviewed or evaluate the user data of a system they used. 2. Data triangulation. With this approach, you need different data sources. The method can remain the same, as can the phenomenon that you're investigating. To vary the data sources, you can change time, location or people. There are almost endless possibilities. Let's look at an example. Suppose your method is expert interviews. You conduct interviews in a company and want to research the adoption of a new logistics system. You could triangulate within the dimension of time. You select your expert, such as the head of the logistics department. Provided the company agrees, you could conduct an interview with the expert at two or three different points in time. Here you would gain wonderful insights, for example, into the period before the implementation of the system, the introduction process and the experiences after the system has been used in the company for some time. The next one would be location. In the same scenario, you could also triangulate the place where you collect data. You could find two other companies where the same system is adopted. Then you interview the heads of the logistics departments in both companies. This way you can make comparisons and examine the phenomenon from two different perspectives. Finally, and I always recommend this, you can triangulate within the sample of data subjects. In addition to the logistics manager, you could include a warehouse specialist and a mid-level manager, for example. Of course, you can triangulate in all three dimensions meaning people, location and time, but this also increases the effort. Consider which type of triangulation or data triangulation would provide the most value for answering your research question. The third type is investigator triangulation. 
This involves briefly switching sides. Two or more researchers can prevent subjective distortions or a so-called bias on the part of the researcher. In our interview example, you could use two interviewers to collect the data. You would have to do it together, take notes independently and then compare your observations. And of course, when you analyze the data, you code the interview transcripts independently and then discuss your results. This type of triangulation is only really feasible if you work in a group. Now before we get to type number four, please consider giving this video a like if you enjoy the content. It really helps me out. The last type of triangulation is quite exciting, but also not easy for beginners like you and me to implement. Before analyzing your data, you must be aware of your theoretical background. By this I mean, which theory do you use to try to understand the data or the phenomenon? Different theories offer different perspectives. In theoretical triangulation, therefore, you would apply several different theoretical frameworks to the data and view the phenomenon from different angles. For example, you could develop a codebook for analyzing your interview transcripts based on a specific management theory. Then you analyze your transcripts or some of them again, this time with a codebook developed using a specific psychological theory. Your imagination is the limit here. Of course, always provided you argue well why you chose those specific theories. To fully understand the concept of triangulation, it's worth looking at the debate that has been carried out in the research literature over the past few decades. It was Densin who originally proposed triangulation as a strategy for validating research results. His idea was to use an additional method to ensure the accuracy of an analysis, but that this additional method is conducted on a much smaller scale. This approach, however, has been repeatedly criticized, leading more and more researchers to argue that different methodological approaches or theoretical perspectives should better be considered equal. It is also important to understand that the research design in qualitative methods does not always have to be strictly predefined. Most textbooks suggest a certain approach with steps you should take, important quality criteria and so on. But in qualitative research, it is always possible to deviate from a blueprint if certain circumstances in your research require it. Triangulation, too, should be understood as an open concept rather than something that needs to follow a strict guideline. If you're familiar with my video on mixed methods, you might wonder what the big difference is, since different methods are combined there, too. Mixed methods and triangulation are indeed two related concepts within empirical social research. They share similarities such as the combination of different methods, but mixed methods represent an independent research strategy that explicitly combines quantitative and qualitative methods to benefit from the strengths of both approaches. Triangulation, on the other hand, is a much broader concept which not only involves the combination of methods, as we learned, although it can, but also includes theoretical perspectives and other subjective viewpoints.